Ghost Hunting in New England, your favorite spooky podcast. Hey everyone, happy Wednesday and welcome to Ghost Hunting in New England with your hosts Amelia and Beth. Happy post-Labor Day. It is after Labor Day by the time everyone's hearing this, but that was just such a depressing statement because it means I'm probably going to have to go back to work soon. That stinks. I know. I've had a long vacation. I've gone lots of places. I've seen lots of things. You have. And I've enjoyed every moment of it. There you go. My life, on the other hand, does not change at all. Yeah. There's a lot more traffic now when you're trying to drive over here, now that all the kids are back. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So maybe we'll get some new listeners from the variety of new students coming in all over the Boston area. Yeah, maybe. You don't sound too enthusiastic about that. No, I'm very enthusiastic. I'm happy. You should tell your face that. I can't. I have Botox. <laughs> So this week, actually, let me back that up and try again. Last week, one of our listeners, one of you all out there, reached out to us, and well, this was actually a couple of months ago, and said, hey, if you ever want to meet, I would love to get together and do some interviewing and some recording. And so we took her up on that. So last Wednesday night, we went and we met up at Danvers State Hospital with the fabulous and generous and funny medium Jamie Day. Yeah, she's a delight. I really enjoyed our time together. She really, I mean, she's a really a just genuine, lovely person. Yes. And I couldn't believe she has, she has a lot of children. She has four kids. Yeah, four kids. And still has this like. Amazing energy all around beautiful, her. Beautiful, youthful. Yes. Energy. Yes. Yeah, yeah, she's great. She's a great person. And yeah. I'm so happy we got to meet her. That was awesome. So it was a really fun experience. Um, Amelia and I carpooled up to Danvers. And so neither one of us had ever been to the Danvers State Hospital before. So as we're driving along, we have Siri telling us, you know, take a left, take a right. And we get all the way up there and we're like, I don't think we're in the right place. There's like a zillion condos everywhere. And so Jamie, meanwhile, was there. We were a few minutes late. That was Amelia's fault. So we're driving up the hill. We're looking around like we can't possibly be in the right place. since we must have put in the wrong address for Siri to take us to. So Jamie's already there and she's taking pictures like this is my current view this is what i'm looking at here's where you're supposed to go and amelia and i are driving all over the property like what is the, the, the condos it's new it's very this is not spooky at all and so we finally found jamie because we were actually at the right place and she was just fantastic Danvers State Hospital has a tremendous history here in the state of Massachusetts, a sad history, and we're going to let Jamie come on and explain some of that. But it is interesting because, as Beth said, it's no longer a state hospital. No, and it's, it's been, not. It's been completely redone. It's surrounded by condos. Main facade is still there. Yes. Beautiful. It is beautiful but there there is there's an eerie feeling around and we did a lot of cool stuff with jamie so we went to this little kind of hidden cemetery that was up there that was very very weird a lot of unmarked graves and there is a heaviness about it there's a cornfield by it that that cornfield was scary as anything yeah it, it's spooky I And especially walking by it at dusk when it was just starting to get to that lovely buggy time of the evening, all I could imagine was just creepy crawlies coming out of the cornfield at us. Yeah, I'm always worried with cornfields that there's going to be a murder in them. Good thing we don't have a lot of cornfields in Massachusetts. Yeah, thank God. I mean, there are some. There's like the corn mazes that you can go to now that it's Halloween season. That's true. All right. So back to the point. Jamie's going to tell us the history of Danvers State Hospital. Could you just tell us a brief history of the hospital and the cemetery we visited? Yeah, sure. So the hospital was opened in the 1870s. It was built to hold about 400 patients. And within 20 years, they had reached up to about 2,000 patients. The attic was full. The basement was full. And from what I hear, they only had nine staff working at any given time. That's so insane. Yeah. And so the patients were overrunning it. They called it 
the Danvers State Sanatorium, the Danvers State Insane Asylum. It wasn't even called Danvers State Hospital until later. The patients were basically overrunning the place, so they were doing the best that they could with shock therapy to try to subdue them, and they would tie them up in straitjackets and leave them to themselves for days. And then when that wasn't working and they weren't able to control the patients with that, they developed this new technique. They heard about it from somewhere else, I guess, but they really pioneered it here at Danvers State. And that was known as the prefrontal lobotomy. So the lobotomy was really founded here and like perfected quote unquote, because it's a horrible term to use, but that's the way they looked at it. They perfected the lobotomy here. That's so sad and upsetting, especially as we talked about earlier today, back in the early 1900s, you could end up in an insane asylum real quick and real easily. Yeah. It was not like today. You could be just overwhelmed one day you just be having a bad day and someone doesn't want to deal with you and they right especially people who didn't have strong family foundations you know if someone's parents died when they were young and they were an orphan if they acted out in any way they were considered insane which you know if your parents die when you're young you've been traumatized and you need therapy you don't need to be locked away so there were some patients like that and there were some people who were violent and were sent up here for good reason but there were also just a lot of people who were special needs and had cognitive or developed mental disabilities. Mm -hmm. They weren't insane. They were differently abled than we are. Right. Yeah. And then to have to go through that and then to say the wrong thing to the wrong person and end up with a lobotomy. I mean, that's horrifying. Yeah. And rumor has it that in addition to all of that, that there was a lot of abuse also. I mean, that to me is abusive enough on its own, but you know, they were left to sit in their own feces and there are allegations of sexual abuse and obviously a lot of neglect, but conditions were pretty deplorable here from what I hear. That's awful. It, it's interesting, not interesting, but yeah, interesting, but not in like a good way, in like a scary, yeah, terrible it's way. Fascinating and horrifying. Yes. When we went to, so Jamie took us down to the cemetery. Can you tell us a little about the cemetery that we yeah. saw? So this is like the saddest part for me. The cemetery, um, as you walk down to it, it's, you know, on a path and you have to go through a cornfield and through some woods. It's not easily accessible. And unless you knew that it was there, you would have no idea that it was there. And when you get down into it, it's kind of this big open grassy field. And all along the edges, there are these stone pillars and each of the pillars has a number on it. And and that's because that's how they were buried. When someone died here, they were buried under a marker with a number and not a name. Rumor has it that there are multiple bodies stacked in each grave. At some point in like the 2000s, a team of people went back and they tried their best to corroborate the names along with the numbers. So there is like a little memorial plaque there that has a lot of names on it. But as we were talking about before, you know, if there's 2,000 people here at any given time, the number, there's not not even 2,000 names on the list. So no. there's way more there's, bodies in there's there. There's not even there. 500 names on the list. Right. I mean, that's it's insane. And we have some photos we'll put on the website, but there are markers all along the edges, but not in the middle. Mm -hmm. And it almost just it seems like it was just a giant mass grave. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't even seem like individual graves stacked. It seems yeah. like a mass grave. Like a potter's field or yeah. whatever you'd call that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is awful mm -hmm. and sad. And there is. There is a heaviness around here for sure. Yeah. So then, you know, they continued the lobotomies and they continued these horrible practices. And eventually the state finally caught up with <laughs> how horrific this behavior was. And they were shut down. This is insane to me because I'm in my 30s. They were shut down when I was in middle school. It's not like it was shut down a long time ago. I was in middle school. So it was 1992. From then on, even more spooky things seemed to happen. Like this place became known as the haunt of the town. It was abandoned and it was left to deteriorate for many years. From what I hear, the police had instructions to just let it burn down if it ever caught fire. It was set to be turned into condos at one point, a lot sooner than it was. And a mysterious fire broke out in the middle of the night and burned at least one of the buildings down. Not the main facade, obviously, but one of the buildings. From what I hear, the security cameras stopped working right before the fire started. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So they weren't able to convert it to condos right then and there like they had hoped because it needed to be fixed, you know, on some level so that they could. Yeah. Wow. 
I'm really excited that we're starting off our kind of ongoing series about the abandoned and haunted asylums in New England with Danvers State Hospital. Jamie, she did a really great job explaining very succinctly the history of it and kind of some of the highlights and lowlights, mainly lowlights, of what was going on there at the hospital. Yeah, so I felt when we went down to the cemetery, there was a real heaviness about it. Where I was interviewing Jamie for this part, we were actually out of the cemetery. We were up on, um, what would you call it, Beth? Like the, the little promenade where you could like overlook the highway? Yes. So we're sitting up there, and even there I felt like a kind of eerie, spooky feeling, looking out over all the woods. We had the asylum behind us. Just the whole... Well, the condos at least were behind us, because well, there's no asylum there anymore. Well, the former asylum is still there. It's, it's been renovated, the inside of it. Right, so it's literally just the front wall. Correct. That, that's okay. what I'm saying. All right. Great. <laughs> Glad we're on the same page now. So just the whole land, the whole area is has a, a feeling and a vibe to it. And yeah, it's spooky. Amelia and I had opposite sort of reactions for when we walked into the cemetery. As we went into the cemetery, I felt fine. Like, and we were walking along and I think at one point there was a shadow of my own phone that I was creating and I actually shrieked and jumped. Yeah, there, there was something that I had done that scared me. So as we were coming out though, it was a lot different because I hadn't felt any sort of real heaviness while I was in there. But as soon as we came out and you have to come through almost like this little tunnel of trees to get out and then you come out into like the open air next to that spooky cornfield that Amelia was talking about, I felt so much lighter when I came out that I didn't even notice how heavy it was inside the cemetery area itself. Yeah, and I felt the exact opposite. I felt fine in the cemetery. It was spooky. It, it is spooky. And not spooky even just for ghosts, but spooky knowing what went on there and the history behind that is just so heavy in itself. It's awful. It's terrible. It's a terrible story. It's terrible that that happened. As we walked out, that's when I got this like insane heaviness. Like, I felt like I couldn't really breathe. Yeah, it was wild. So Jamie had weighed in on this as well, and she had said that similarly she felt very heavy in the cemetery, but then lighter once we came mm. out onto the path. Jamie, over the course of our, we were with her a couple hours, yeah. um, she shared a whole bunch of different stories, personal stories that she had from the cemetery area, and she also shared a lot of stories that she had heard secondhand from other people, thirdhand, and so luckily we were able to record a good number of those, and we'll share them with you as we come kind of move through the podcast tonight. But as we were coming back up the path from the cemetery, Jamie shared this particular story with us. So my theory <laughs> is actually that the land has some pretty significant heavy energy to it. Okay. I I don't even know. I can't even tell you like why I believe that. But like just driving down past the street, sometimes I've seen things, sometimes I've felt things. Like I've seen a girl running out in front of my car several times. The same girl every time. See, I think it's heavy now. I'm like heavy. Yeah. Ooh. So I see this, when I drive down the road, I've seen it several times. This girl runs out and she's in like a, like a hospital gown. Runs out in front of the road in front of me. And there are dogs chasing her. And I saw it so many times that I, one time I pulled my car over. He's like, okay, like let's connect. Let's have this conversation. <laughs> and she told me that she was a young girl who just wasn't listening to her parents and shipped her away because they were, you know, she was like a troublemaker. And she was horrifically abused, like detailed, like graphic sexual abuse to me. Said that it was by one nurse or whatever in particular. And she tried to escape, I guess, several times is what is like the impression that I got off of it. Oh. Got caught every time. Oh, gosh. What if they sent dogs after her? I wonder. I wonder if there's like a way to even look it up. I've kind of tried to like. How'd you like that cereal chewing going on? No, just kidding. We were walking up the path and it was rocks and it, it is a it's a loud clip. But one of the things that I got thinking about as she was telling that story was the idea that was this girl being chased by dogs that they had set on her from the asylum. And just how horrible would that be that not only are you treated so inhumanely as a person, but then they just set dogs after you to hunt you down when you try to get away because you're being abused. Yeah, the things that went on at that place are so horrific. Honestly, I, I really believe the things that go on in a lot of those types of hospitals now 
are horrific and it basically becomes a jail, but it's a jail for people who, no matter what they say, aren't ever taken seriously. And that in itself is very, very scary. But the things that went on there, and we've come so far in our society addressing mental health and helping people with mental health issues. I think we still have a very long way to go, but this wasn't that long ago. No. All this, happened. this was not that long ago. The hospital closed in 1992. Yeah, yeah. Like, we were alive. Right. That's 27 years ago. Yeah. Were you were you alive? Unfortunately. Oh. But not for long, right? Not for long. Not for long. Okay. I wasn't.